Right, yes. So, um, uncovering past human affections using ancient DNA. Now, the word ancient DNA, the concept, uh, brings with it a lot of baggage, not least because of uh, this book and the subsequent film, but more rooted in reality. Um, there's been great spectacular successes, in particular in the uh, early human ancestors, uh, looking at uh, Neanderthals and so on, um, with H uh, looking at their ancient human DNA. But unfortunately, there's, there's some problems with this. There's reliance on amplification, it's, it's, um, and it introduces the risk of contamination. So obviously, you've got your uh, this work. you've got your uh, DNA from your handlers, so you've got to be in a very uh, a well well-founded well ancient DNA lab, and you get ample reliance on amplification, so you get carryover. And unfortunately, this has led to some failures. So the first paper that reported a megabase of Neanderthal DNA um, it later has shown that 8% of it was actually contamination from the, human, um, the humans in the lab. So this has led to a certain schism between the community, in particular, with Egyptian mummies and, and samples from hot, dry countries where some people say that it's not at all possible, it's just too degraded, the DNA is too degraded, you can't be sequencing it. But I'll simply say, yes, you can if you're careful and you look in the right places. Now, if we move on to paleo microbiology, we're well, slightly further ground, as, as Mark Hutton mentioned, um, the substantial literature, in particular the Simia pestis, um, spearheaded by uh, Michelle Junko. Um, we've also got paleogenomics of other things. Like that I mentioned, and TB. Now, this uh, using these kind of methods, you've got less risk of contamination because obviously your handlers aren't infected. What we hope they're not infected with tuberculosis, leprosy, and plague. So you are actually sequencing what was in your sample. Again, though, unfortunately, there is a schism between skeptics and believers who say, no, this can't possibly survive in, in the conditions you're saying in these mummies or whatever. But I think the tide is now turning and people are believing that you can actually sequence um, ancient human infections or historical human infections. So this is the field that we came into a few years ago, ably led by our collaborators in Birmingham. This is David Minikin and Helen Donnelly. Hmm? A few months ago, not a few years ago. Well, we I don't smack it, but we started it. It's been kind of a hobby side project, so it's been first and start, I'd say. Um, as I was saying, Helen Donahue in, in London. And we wanted to bring our own spin on things, so we said, well, let's not rely on amplification, let's do metagenomics. We were riding on the high from the German Esnet project where we looked at the metagenomics of, um, of stool samples, so we said, well, why can't we apply the same approach we had with Cesare into our ancient DNA studies? So why do we do this? Well, you have an avoidance of amplification, no risk of PCR amplifying um, amplify carryover, contamination with other things in the lab, you have a low risk of that. And we're also avoiding this hybridization factor. So um, there was a recent, well, about a year ago now, was a paper saying that they got TB using a sequence capture approach, um, and that was a group in Durham who did it. But we wanted to avoid this, so we don't need to design any baits and captures. And we, it's assumption free, we're looking at everything. So we're going to find the unknown unknowns. But this does cause problems with a sledgehammer to suck in nuts. We might be getting a high abundance of human DNA. And obviously there we've got a lot of post-contamination, post mortem contamination, either from the soil or just as the body decays. Nevertheless, we tried it just to see what we'd find. And um, so we tried it on these samples that Helen had in her wine cellar, actually. And they come from um, a city known as Back Hungary. So this is uh, north of Budapest in Pest country. It's on the eastern banks of the Danube. It's very picturesque. Um, uh, around about the mid 18th century, the city underwent a, a large expansion. They built a new cathedral, the empress visited to so get an arch to celebrate it. But fast forward 200 years to 1994, and some workers were doing some rebuilding work in the Dominican, Dominican church here, and they rediscovered a crypt which contained 242 bodies. It was used for the Sloan Square equivalent of the, of the city, and it was used for the burial of middle class families and clerics. Um, for about a hundred years or so, and then it was shut and forgotten about. And because of the conditions in there, it was quite dry, it was cold, about 10 degrees, many of these bodies man uh, naturally mummified into, I've got some examples here, so they're wonderfully mummified, they're still in the clothes that they were buried in, obviously someone put them in the browser, that's degraded since then, but it's a really wonderful sample set that we had here, to uh, just to look at. Now, if you look at the, um, the prevalence of TB in Europe, 
um, as you can see, if you look at, I don't unfortunately have a graph of it, but it's been decreasing with BCG and, and other um, things. But during the 18th century, which is where these people were living, it was probably quite high, probably just before the births into Europe, but definitely the people would probably have been exposed to TB in the community. And indeed, when they did x-rays of, of some of these individuals, you saw um, quite clear evidence that they probably were suffering, if not from disseminating the base of TB. So here we've got a 22-year-old male who had a gross spinal deformity, which is evidence of POTS disease. And here you have a well-nourished 95-year-old. So these people are looking for a long edge, um, this female, and she had a calcificated um, lesion on her lung, just here. Um, and actually, it was from this individual that they tried to uh, revive MTV um, from, from the lungs. And unfortunately, they didn't manage to. They tried it in culture, they tried it in guinea pigs and like, subsequent models. But they did manage to do an acid fast study and find the acid fast study in the lung sample. So, if we can't say it was TB, it would probably be most likely that. And they've done various, um, our collaborators have done various studies looking at. Um, uh, the recurrence in, in these mummies, and then what, what the difference is using uh, spoligotyping methods in, in family groups. So now I would like to introduce you to our first uh, mummy. So this is body 68. It's Terezia Hausman. She actually uh, died 28 years old uh, on, the, on Christmas Day. Now her chest x-ray was clear, but she appeared cathetic to who was very wasted and small for her age. And microbiology and molecular analysis did, on her chest sample, on her lung sample, did actually confirm she probably had TB when she died. So I was given a piece of her lung tissue, it's just here, and I extracted DNA from it. Made a library exactly the same method as, as I'd done previously for the German outbreak study. Um, unfortunately, I did do a size selection here, so it's probably throwing away some of our sample. But nevertheless, we got it to cluster after some uh, abortive attempts. We got it to cluster on the MySeq. And uh, we got 5.5 million reads. So the first thing that uh, uh, Martin, somewhere in the audience, actually did this, he aligned it next to human DNA, because I was, I was convinced it was all going to be human DNA. That was less than 1% of it aligned to the human genome. So we went, OK, what else is there? Well, let's align it to TB, because that's what we were hoping to find. And actually, yes, we did. We found 8% of it, of all the metagenomic reads, aligned to TB, with an average of 32-fold coverage. Now, we'd never handled TB in our lab. We, we don't do TB, we were doing other things, and we'd never um, actually handed in DNA, so we'd done no TB-specific PCR. So this is unlikely to be laboratory contamination. And actually, if you look, so this is the mapping of um, all the metagenomic reads against uh, a model pair of TBs, H37RB, and you can see it's deep and even around 30-fold, the spike is near to the ribosomal. And then if we zoomed in further into to look at indels in particular, ones that were characteristics of a, a recent German outbreak one, which is 7199-99. And we found that the reads were missing in this region. So we thought, okay, brilliant. So we've got um, a strain here that is sufficiently different from h 7 rb but quite similar to a modern lineage uh, known as the urban Harlem lineage, prevalent in Europe and in America. So we thought, great, let's look at the kind of global view of this. So recent, at, at that time, a paper came out by Comet et al. when they looked at a various number of uh, uh, TB complex genomes and they did a step tree. So we just tried to slot in our mommy genome into this. So here I've just done it in the same colours. And our one, it did indeed fit it in with this European American African, African lineage. But it, instead of being close to 7199 9, which was what we thought it was, it fell closer to the, uh, the reference. So we thought, this is wrong, something's wrong here, what was it? It's actually Martin who figured this out, so he went back and looked at his SNP filtering. And here, on the left here, you've got uh, the SNPs for your reference using 7199, and then we've got our SNPs in the mummy ones. And it turns out that actually an awful lot of them, all the ones in green, were actually being filtered out because they gave us a mixed signal. We, we set the filter at 80%, so you had to have 80% consensus there before we would count it as a SNP. And we were filtering out all these ones in green because they were giving us a mixed signal. So when you looked from further at the SNP pileups, we actually find it. We've got a lot of these, so these are the reads compared to the reference, and a lot of them are showing um, either a C or a, a G there. And as you can see, in 7199 compared to the reference, it's always Cs. So we thought, hang on, this might be evidence of a mixed infection. And actually, the coverage um, confirmed this or, or implicated it as well. So here's another type of coverage plot here. We're looking at um, regions of no deletions. 
So this is just the whole, um, whole reference with the region mapped onto it. And this is a region of known deletion. So here, the coverage dropped down to zero. The, the delete is now zero. But we found a couple of locations where instead of dropping down completely to zero, it came to about half, so from 13 to about 15. So we interpreted this as being a loss in one strain, but not the other. And we'd never heard of mixed TB PB infections before. So um, we looked into the literature and we said, well, actually, is there any modern examples of, of mixed infection? And yes, recent work has highlighted the importance of mixed strain infection, particularly in areas of high endemicity, so uh, KwaZulu Natal in, in South Africa has got a lot of cases there. So we wrote this up and we, we said, well, Tourette's Houseman, we think, suffered from mixed infection of TB. And actually, there was a precedent for this in her family. So within the crypt, there's also her younger sister and her mother. And the younger sister, um, worked by swallowing was thought to have a mixed infection. Now, I've since repeated this, uh, since we came to Warwick, and it was a slightly different piece of gum tissue. But I'm, I've, got a, I've got the technique down now, and we've got much, much more data, much, much more reads. Um, again, less than 1% of it mapped to human, this time 28% mapped to a 7199-99. So obviously, it, we've seen variations within uh, different pieces of tissue. We've got mu uh, a 550-fold data here. So with the greater fold data, we're now being able to see slight differences in the SNP. So instead of a 50-50 uh, infection, we're now seeing maybe 45-55, which we're hoping we'll be able to use to, SNP, um, to bin the different SNPs and and just look a bit more detail into the strain genotypes that we've got. So, um, just some, a couple more slides. Have I got enough time? Yep, a couple more slides from some work I've been doing over the last two weeks, really. So, two more bodies that I've got. So, this is body one to one, Belitsky Laszlo. He um, has a Hrunk Hungarian name. And interestingly, he was a steward of the estate rather than a landowner. Now, he didn't die of TB or any other sort of infectious. He died in a house fire. He had smoke in his lungs. Um, so I got a, a piece of his lung and I, I scraped off the, uh, the inner layer of the nearest pleura and we did um, extract the DNA with the runs on it. This time much more of it mapped to human, around 5%. Unfortunately, when we mapped it to TB, the results were much, much harder to interpret. So here I've got the coverage plot. It's very spiky compared to the other one I showed you. And it's probably only, I'd say probably one, one fold coverage, if that. So it appears, we think, to be a mixture of TB and, and maybe another closely related mycobacterium. But I think we can probably say this guy maybe had a, a latent infection there, but it definitely didn't kill him. The house fire did. And then the next one, this is just from last week, in fact. This is Body 28. So this is Anna Shun. She was the mother of Tourette's Houseman, and she died a few years earlier, aged 55. I had a piece of abdomen tissue from here, and it was a very good one. I was quite happy with this, and very little appear to map to human. Here, we're also seeing a very, very spiky coverage plot, but it's around, I'd say, 15-fold. So we're saying here, again, we'll interpret this to be, yes, um, Anna Shona also probably had TB when she died, and, but there seems to be some sort of contamination going on, perhaps in the crypt or perhaps during uh, the uh, breakdown of the body of this other mycobacterium getting in. So how do we plan to take this further? Now, I've got in the... Uh, in our cold room currently, another 22 uh, body samples from various people who died uh, over the 100 years that the crypt was in use. And they come from seven family groups. And we hope to look at the genotype of the various um, TBs we managed to recover from these samples in relation to date of birth. So as I mentioned, uh, when these people were living, the, the city was undergoing a great period of expansion. And there were people coming in from the countryside, potentially bringing in their own uh, strains of TB and mixing there. So it'd be really interesting to see how it's changed over time. Maybe look at the epidemiology of a, a town 200 years ago and look at the TB there. And then we hope to um, further our HEB and we're working on other things. So we've got um, samples that have been co-infected with uh, leprosy and TB and Brucello TB with uh, Raffaella Pianucci, which hopefully will kind of be Birmingham at Warwick soon. We can chat over what things we do. I'd just like to acknowledge the people involved in the study, Mark, who uh, conceived the idea, and Martin, who's been instrumental in it, helping with the bioinformatics side of things, and our collaborators in Hungary, in Berlin, and the West. Thank you for your time.